So in my last video, I promised that I was going to head over to the Mac show and uh, show you what I found there. And sure enough, as promised, I went there this weekend. Come on with me and let's check it out. Hey guys, here I am at the Mac show. First place I stopped was Kelly Hicks booth and he had a bunch of helmets and flags. Um, just an overview of the Mac show. It was about 90% flags and memorabilia, not guns. So not entirely my cup of tea. I don't know a lot about this, but I do know Kelly Hicks and he stands behind what he sells. He always has lots of SS helmets and uniforms. You can see here there's uh, SS helmets. It was a lot of memorabilia, uh, uniforms, hats, uh, not as many guns this year, and that was probably because of COVID. A lot of the dealers stayed away, and there weren't a lot of customers. So uh, Kelly was explaining what he has. With me being a knucklehead, I forgot to turn on the microphone. So all of everything he said, we completely missed. So I'm just going to talk over it, let you know that these were some really cool SS tunics uh, in fantastic condition. And uh, the reason I like to deal with Kelly is he does, uh, he does guarantee what he sells. Now these, uh, these are the uh, collar tabs, also the shoulder tabs, it had GD, which um, I thought stood for gosh darn it, but in fact GD stood for uh, Greater Deutschland. Uh, he also showed me the inside, um, explained how they were made. Uh, it was actually quite fascinating, I'm sorry you guys missed this because he did a much better job of explaining it than I do. Oh, this, um, this tunic I really like because it was from Turrigan, and that's where the Walder factory is from. So this was an SS uh, guy who uh, was stationed in the Turrigan region, or at least in that group. Uh, you see the RZM uh, logo under there, which is the purchasing department. And again, the collar tabs. Uh, he was uh, explaining to me what all the different uh, markings meant, and most of it went right over my head. Because, as I mentioned, I was looking for guns, but still, it was uh, good to be at the show. Just gives you a, a good idea of the quality of merchandise that can be found at the show. He did show me the pants. Not a lot to say here other than those little leather straps. That actually clips under their boot uh, right up against the heel uh, to keep their pants from riding up. I, that's something I think I could have used in high school. Uh, so this was Larry. Uh, Larry, I was walking by and I really liked Larry because he recognized me. He said, hey, you're Tom from Legacy uh, YouTube channel. So he watches uh, YouTube and he gave me great commentary. But unfortunately, as I said, I didn't get the audio and I apologize for that. He talked about the unit marking and this is a Cossack tunic. So the Cossacks, of course, were in Russia. Uh, it turns out they did not like Stalin or communism. And so they joined the German army and this is one of their very, very rare Cossack tunics. I actually thought this was really cool. We asked about these little, uh, you know, these little holders, and those are for holding large cartridges, large shells uh, that the Cossacks are famous for. It looks like the size of a, of a shotgun, but in fact, it's just a very large caliber cartridge. Uh, with some uh, medals here that I didn't know much about, but uh, he had a lot of Japanese items. You see the Japanese hats and mask, but also there's a Papa Nambu. Here's a, a gun that you're going to be seeing in a little bit. This is a PDM, something that everybody's looking for. That was on this table and uh, caught my eye, something I was very interested in. You'll see it again in a little bit. Um, but then he also had an engraved Walder 9. So I picked that up, uh, checked it out. That was something that I was interested in. So I, I negotiated with him a little bit on buying that pistol. And you see the little holster that came with it. As I said, you'll, you'll see that again. He did have uh, this uh, Papa Nambu, which I was very interested in, thought about uh, buying it. it it's uh, a, a nice example slotted with the uh, shoulder stock. Uh, but as I asked him questions about it, he uh, let me know that it was a reproduction shoulder stock. So at that point, I decided against it. These are uh, some of the hats and the Japanese masks. Uh, now I came, uh, the next table I went by had a lot of American gear, uh, which I spent some time just uh, perusing through here. I didn't buy any of this, but 
Uh, he had a display of uniforms that I found pretty fascinating. These are all World War I, and they're different units that were sent over and fought in World War I in France, Belgium. And um, I, I spent some time learning a little bit about the, the unit markings and some of the soldiers that uh, would have used these. Uh, and then as you turn the corner uh, on this display, you get to the World War II items. That's uh, obviously an uh, airborne unit uh, with their boots. And you see the leather jacket, the bombardier jacket. That actually uh, was with the U.S. Navy, a pilot with the U.S. Navy. And there was more other, there were other uh, bomber jackets, all of them very cool. And I thought the prices were very fair. The condition was really nice. Ran into this guy, just thought he was fascinating, so I thought I'd get a picture in front of him, a, a samurai soldier. Uh, then we came across, this is uh, Africa Corps, uh, so uh, Desert Fox kind of uh, get up, and uh, also different pilots and helmets. Uh, a lot of uh, interesting helmets here. I'm not sure that they were all uh, original, because they were the condition was too nice, but they were very cool looking. Now we transition into daggers. There's always lots of daggers and swords there. In fact, I, I usually interview Tom Whitman and he has a huge display of daggers. Oh, I came across Ava Braun's uh, plate. I have one exactly like that, which I've already shown you. And that is in my video about Ava Braun's ring. RH, I've seen that plate before. I don't remember what it stands for, but it looks like an SS guy. And then, of course, everybody's favorite would be the Christmas balls. They go on your tree. Everybody needs SS Christmas balls uh, for Christmas. Uh, and finally, we see a silver set that somebody brought home at the end of the war as a souvenir. And you can check that out. Pretty cool. So what treasures did I find at the Mac show? Let's check it out. First and foremost, I'm going to show you two engraved guns and I'm going to get up close and personal so you can check these out. Okay, so I picked up two engraved guns. This, guess what that is? I'll put that away, but see if you can guess. Oh, that, that's a big clue right there. Um, we'll check that out, but first, uh, post-war P-38. Now, uh, from the box, and it's also inner arms marked, I'm thinking the 1970s. I, I'm not doing a lot of research on these, so if you guys want to comment, feel free. I do know these pretty well. I don't tend to collect post-war guns. I like war era, uh, but check out the engraving on this. Now, you see Ohm factory. Uh, we know that up until 1945, they were all made at the Zella Mellis factory in Turrigan. Uh, they moved it to Ulm because uh, the Zellamelis factory ended up in the Russian sector. And so the Walder family bought property in Ulm and set up a new shop there. Uh, you see the classic oak leaf and acorn, which is what they use for the PPs and PPKs. And also, if you watch my videos, you know that in Zellamelis, they never made an engraved P-38. They all were used for the military. Well, not all. A majority were used for the military or for the police. Some commercial guns were also made. But if you want a factory engraved P-38, you're going to have to go post-war, and certainly that's what this is. Now, notice the barrel has very little, very little engraving except for right here. And the front strap has a very nice engraving with a little oak leaf at the bottom. Uh, notice the bottom of the magazine little checkers, checkering, uh, and you do see that it was imported by inner arms. So again, post-war, post made in West Germany, so before the uh, reunification, uh, just beautifully engraved gun. Very hard to find. They've made very few of them, but this is factory engraved. And so when I say uh, Walther never engraved a P-38, I should correct that by saying uh, before 1945, they never made an engraved P-38. Now, you may find them, but they're special presentation guns that were done outside of the factory. So that was one thing that I picked up. This won't last long because somebody out there wants it right now. Okay, let's solve this mystery. If you guessed a Walther Model 9, you are correct. A cute little uh, soft leather pouch to keep it in. Uh, but this is the uh, Walther Model 9. 
Now, unlike the other one, this, this is uh, pre-1945, but the engraving was done post-1945. So this is not factory engraved, I can tell by the style. Also, whoever did it removed the Walther logo, and Walther tended to not do that unless it was for someone very special. But I can tell from the style, uh, the newness of the nickel, that this is post-factory engraved, but still, I thought it was really cool. Uh, first of all, we do have uh, either fake ivory grips or sometimes uh, an ivory look-alike grip, uh, very nicely done. I think the grips themselves would sell pretty well. There's signs of age here. If it fits on a Walther Model 9, then they're pretty rare. Uh, this is in 25 caliber, uh, cute little gun. It is hard to cock. I find that uh, it, just because you can't get your hand, you get like two fingers here, two fingers here. So when you cock it, the, uh, you can see the firing pin is back so that you know it's ready to go. And the trigger pull is actually pretty hard. I mean, I, I've had to put a lot of pressure on that. Now, the only thing that I don't like what they did to this gun, I, I kind of like the grips, even though they're not politically correct. The engraving is nice. Um, again, post factory, this is not factory engraved, but it'll sell very easily. Uh, but here's what I don't like. They put a little lanyard on there. I guess so you can put it on a chain and hang it in. Uh, put it in your vest pocket. So kind of like a pocket watch, you could put it there. Um, it is an original Walther magazine. You can see the Walther logo. Uh, but that's so you can put it on a chain and put it in your vest pocket. So once again, this one probably will not last long. Okay, we were just looking at an engraved Model 9. This is a Model 8. Beautiful high polish finish. You see a little bit of wear on it, but right here you can see the Walder banner, uh, the blued finish, and it does say Model 8. There's the safe mode and fire mode. Uh, you see the disc, the Walder banner here, also the Walder banner magazine. Tw again, 25 caliber, uh, excellent condition. Look how beautiful that is. And remember I said Zellamella's factory in Turrigan. Now this uh, particular gun came with capture papers. And if you watch my videos, you know that we've been doing a lot of videos and specializing in capture papers and I've been getting a lot of requests. So right here you see German pistol in 25 caliber. There's the serial number that matches the gun. Once again, to go along with everything that I've been saying, it's dated October of 45, so the war is over. People are waiting around and gathering up souvenirs uh, to take home. And there's the uh, GI number and the signature of the guy who brought it back. That's October of 45. Hey, let's take a look at the American theater. You know, it wasn't just the Germans that have pistols. This is a military-issued um, victory model, Smith & Wesson. So it comes in 38 Special. You see it's a Smith & Wesson, comes in 38 Special. There's some writing here, which you won't be able to read. Uh, right here it says, say, uh, 38 Special cartridge, made in USA. There's the logo for Smith & Wesson. Uh, the way you can tell it's a victory model, first of all, very plain grips, uh, nothing fancy because it wasn't made for commercial use. Also, they have a case-hardened hammer. Uh, and the finish is usually a dull finish. Again, they, uh, this is also case hardened, by the way. But case hardened, case hardened, and then you'll see like a dull finish because uh, they weren't selling it to the public, didn't have to be glamorous. It was just utility use for military. And the other way you can tell is the victory models always start with a V. That's a flaming bomb, acceptance by the Springfield Armory, I believe. Um, but this uh, victory model is marked with a V. Uh, followed by the serial number. And again, they do have a lanyard loop that is factory. Uh, these actually function very well uh, and they were pretty plentiful. This comes with a factory letter, so it's not a capture paper, but a factory letter from the historian at Smith & Wesson. Total production was 850,000. So that's a, a lot of, uh, that's a lot of revolvers. And you do find these at gun shows fairly often. Prices keep uh, creeping up, just like all of the uh, higher end collectibles, the prices just keep going up. This particular uh, gun, I think on the second page, uh, it does have that it's uh, early 1944. Now this was shipped to the United States Maritime Commission. So it could have been the Coast Guard, but I believe the Maritime uh, Commission actually were the transports, the escorts for the uh, 
uh, cargo ships that are crossing the Atlantic. Um, they helped with the crossing uh, to make sure the ships arrived safely in London, but they were protective vehicles and the merchant marines were involved in uh, transporting uh, goods. And they did get government contract uh, for this Smith & Wesson. So a nice historical piece that we will be offering. Speaking of the Maritime Commission, this is the other side of the war. This is actually a German. You can tell by the Eagle Swastika M. It stands for Marine, or in Germany, that would be the Navy. So this is a model 1934 Mauser, made by Mauser, 1934. Uh, this one was probably made in about 39 or maybe even 40. Um, by 1940, 41, they were making the HSC instead but this uh, came before the HSC. It comes in 32 caliber, uh, very nice original finish, and the Navy marking really uh, helps the value quite a bit, makes it quite desirable. Now, they also used a property mark on the front strap. The N property mark stands for North Sea, so that was up by Kiel, uh, north of uh, Germany in the North Atlantic. Uh, you see the property mark, and then on the magazine, you can see it matches 3324, 3324. So this, was, uh, this has a matching magazine, comes together, uh, a real find and getting harder and harder to find these in any kind of condition. Okay, so we can tell by the butt end that this is a uh, Walther PP, and some of you are mistakenly going to say, ah, bottom release, it must be 9 millimeter. It is not. But when I open this up, a few of you out there are going to go absolutely ape and contact me and say, I want it, hold it for me. The problem is, I'm thinking about keeping this one. Now, the gun was made in 1934, and that's right, if you're following my lead and trying to guess, um, I already said the bottom release almost always was 9mm, but in this case, it is 7.65, but it's a special contract for the Police Department of Munich. So a PDM, that's the property number, PDM, Police Department of Munich, and they did order them in 7.65, and they did order them with the bottom release. Now, this is made in about 1934 for the Munich police, uh, highly desirable. And this holster, like, well, it certainly didn't come with it because this is uh, dated 1941. It does say Berlin, but that's the maker of the holster. It, it could have been put together later. Uh, it does have a police eagle. That's the police style eagle from 1941. So this was probably added to this holster again, just because it says Berlin doesn't mean it's the Berlin police. It means that the company that made the holster was found in Berlin, but these did come together. Um, now here's what makes this, I've actually never seen one before and, um, and very, very cool. Uh, this comes with two matching mags. Now, the, this contract, the PDM, did come with the only contract I know of that came with two finger extension bottoms. Normally you get one finger extension bottom and a flat bottom for your spare. This properly has two finger extension bottoms. What also which makes these special, and this, you guys already know what's coming, a proper PDM magazine does not have the notch right here, and these are proper PDM magazines. Let me show you the notch. Here's the standard 7.65, and the magazine has the notch right there, and that's because the push button. It clicks, push the button. When it clicks, it pops in here and holds the magazine in place, right? Then when you push the button, it pops out. With the PDM, there is no push button because of the bottom release. I think these are much more awkward. I like the push button better, but for whatever reason, when uh, the head of the police department of Munich ordered these, he got what he wanted. Because do you know who the head of the police department of Munich was in 1934? It was actually, that's right, Heinrich Himmler. So he ordered these and they gave him whatever he wanted, but this comes with two finger extension bottom with no notch. Uh, the magazines alone can sell for five to six hundred dollars. Oh, I forgot the best part. Here's what I've never seen before. You guys are saying, what do you mean you never saw one before? This comes with two matching magazines. This is actually number one, number two, and you can barely see 554, which matches the property number.
Now, I've never seen these numbered before. This was not done in the factory, by the way, because every other PDM, and I probably had a dozen of them, they weren't numbered in this way. So I have to conclude that they were numbered post-factory, probably at the p police arsenal. They put them together, didn't want them to get mixed up, and you know how fastidious the Germans are. That's a good thing for you German people. Uh, they're very fastidious, and so in this case, they, ma they numbered the magazines. I've got two matching magazines to go with this PDM and a Berlin 1941 holster. A very cool find. Okay, when I was showing you an example of a push-button mag, uh, this is actually another gun that I picked up. Not, I wasn't even going to show you because it just looks like a standard commercial gun. No markings, no markings. It is early. You'll notice that it's, uh, they started at 750000 so this is about 100000 later. So it just looks like a, a commercial model, nothing special. Uh, but the guy on this tag, he had a little tag on it and it said, Police PP. And I said, There's nothing, this is not a police PP. There's no marking on it at all that indicates police. But it's so early, and the police did buy some, but they had no special marking. Later, they marked them either Eagle F or Eagle C. In this case, the only thing that designates this to be police is that it has a matching magazine. Now, this again is not done at the factory, just like the PDM magazine, not done at the factory. It was done at a police arsenal later. So the police ordered this right out of the commercial stock. Maybe they got, let's say they ordered 20 of them, and they numbered the mags. This, I'm sure, came with two matching magazines when it was first issued. Uh, in this case, this is magazine number one. And the other way I can tell it was added post-factory is if you look on an angle, it's dented. So you can see it is slightly dented, and that's because when it was done in the factory, they stamped these magazines before they were hardened. In this case, it left the factory, it was hardened, and now when they go to stamp it, they have to hit it really hard, and that causes those indentations. So this is post-factory, done at the police arsenal, but I do agree that this is a police PP early enough that it doesn't have a police inspector mark. Oh, remember this Navy from about five minutes ago? I didn't get two of them. This is the same one, but I took this out of order. I should have done this right after it because remember I said 1934, they probably made this one in about 1939 or early 1940. Then they started making the HSC. Much better design, much sleeker, and very, uh, you know, it was an improvement for Mauser. Again, made by Mauser. This is the model HSC. This is also navy marked, but it's a very tiny marking. You would never be able to figure out. To me, that just looks like any Waffen stamp. You know, usually it would be Waffen 655 or Waffen 135. But in this case, what the heck is it? I see the eagle, and maybe I can make out an M. And the only way to, for me to show you what this looks like is to show you a drawing of one blown up. And here it is. It's basically... It's the Navy marking that HSC used mid-war. So they, they did, for a period of time, put the uh, big eagle here. Uh, they used a closed-wing eagle right here. Actually, here's a picture of one. They have a closed-wing eagle with the M underneath. They used that for a period of time. But mid-war, mid they were saving time and money, and all they did is whack it with this stamp, which was the Navy marking in the mid-war period. Okay, now I'm going to show you two occupied countries. Most of the guns I've shown you, other than the Victory model, they've been made in Germany. These are two occupied guns, meaning when the Germans went in and occupied a territory, they took over the factories and produced guns for themselves. Sequentially, this one would have been first because they took over Czechoslovakia. They walked in and annexed Czechoslovakia. I think that was in 39. Again, I'm not doing a lot of research. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Might have been 38, but I know they invaded Poland in late 39. I believe they took over Czechoslovakia in early 39. Uh, and this is an early high polish. Look at the high polish on this. It's a CZ-27 made in Czechoslovakia. But when the Germans came in and took over the factory, look at that front strap. Germans came in and took over the factory, um, then they produced them for their war effort. Now, they did make some police, but the vast majority, about 95% of the ones you find, they're Waffen proof right here. And that is a Waffen 76. And uh, also, you'll find it at the top of the slide. 
right here. Barely readable, but the serial number is here and the serial number is here. This is about as good as they come. Just absolutely beautiful. Uh, so this one uh, will sell very quickly. Again, you see the straw parts. The small parts are straw color and the hammer is straw color as well. Um, but just a beautiful gun. Now, one thing to watch out for with CZs, almost always right here, it'll be chipped. There's a little edge here and all you have to do is set it down on something and that chips them. I, I would say 99.9% .9 of the time they're chipped right here. And these have, are intact. That's how, that's how uh, beautiful this gun is. And it's from the very early war period because this is a high polish finish. Most of them are very dull or even phosphated. Here you see one uh, later in the war, mid-war to late war. Uh, they just hurried up and just threw on a very cheap finish and most of them look like this. This also comes with a pebble grain holster. Uh, because this is early, I, th I uh, wanted to see if this also might be early, but the pebble grain holsters came later. So I'm sure this was added later. There is writing here um, that may have a date, but because of the pebble grain, I, I can't make it out. Uh, but I would almost guarantee this, this is a CZ holster, but goes to a later pistol. It happens to have come with this pistol, which is a beautiful early high polish. Now, speaking of beautiful high polish finish, check this out. I walked up to the table and by the way, most of this stuff I way overpaid for, but I already described why. I go, I go to these shows, there'd be nothing to buy if I wanted to just buy bar bargains, but the price on the table was way too high for a Beretta. But because of the condition, I mean, if you look at a thousand of these, you won't find one that is in this condition. Now it has a double A suffix, which means that it was uh, made during the German occupation. The uh, Germans came in, took over the factory because the Italians weren't moving fast enough. Well, the Italian workers stayed there, but the, uh, the, the Germans ran the factories. You know, German efficiency uh, and doesn't hurt to have slave labor. Uh, to, in order to get things done, you just could tell people get it done or else. Uh, so they were able to uh, produce a lot more pistols. Uh, this comes in nine millimeter, actually. I just noticed they made them in both 32 caliber and nine millimeter. This is a nine millimeter dated 1943. And right here you can see nine millimeter and that would be uh, short, nine millimeter short, the same as uh, 380 ammo in the US. This is a uh, German nine millimeter short. Uh, this is a proof mark, an Italian proof mark. Uh, later, they would go to a 4UT, and there was very few of them that are Waffen stamped. We've sold them. They sell for a, a premium, but for the most part, these were never Waffen stamped. You just have to go by serial number to figure out um, whether it was made during the Italian era or the uh, German occupation. Okay, the only thing remaining is uh, three Lugers, two here on the table and one in my lap. I'm gonna show you three Lugers that I picked up. I, I bought uh, some rifles as well. We probably brought home about 30, 40 guns. Again, uh, we had to pay top dollar to bring anything home. And um, if, I, if I waited for bargains, I, I, I would have come home empty handed. Uh, this is another one that I way overpaid for. Um, but I saw, the, I saw the holster. First of all, it's Germany marked, which means it, it was a commercial holster made for export. Uh, we'll take a look at the gun, uh, you, but just look at this holster. I, I was told the guy that sold me the gun with the holster said that somebody offered him $600 just for the holster, but he wanted to keep them together. Uh, here's the gun itself. Now, you, if you've watched my videos about uh, this is the way it, it looked when it came out of the factory or factory original or time machine guns, this would be a time machine gun. This is a commercial Luger. Look at the... Uh, in fact, when I rub my hands on this, I can feel it pulling the thread. That's how sharp these, these grips, the diamonds are very, very sharp. You see some fire blue even on the screw, fire blue here. The condition of this gun is just phenomenal. A little bit of fire blue and then straw, straw color on the small parts. But just take a look at that finish. Now this comes in 30 caliber. I saw it and I said, I'm gonna buy it. And uh, Chris, who works with me, he came by and say, 
why are you buying that? It's too much money. I said, yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, Mark Germany for export. Very, it's very well could have come to the United States. The magazine will be a nickeled magazine in beautiful condition. Wood bottom, and it is blank uh, because military and the police would number the bottom. But for the commercial market, they didn't bother with that. So just a beautiful gun. There's no date. It was made by DWM, probably between the wars, so in the 1920s. Uh, no date, DWM, and it's 30 caliber Luger. It does have a blank uh, Luger tool here, meaning there's no uh, proof mark on it, but that's a Luger tool that came with it. And just an absolutely stunning gun, uh, which I will be offering uh, to our, our audience. <laughs> at a very inflated price. Uh, one other thing I wanted to point out uh, is uh, the crown end proof, which is a commercial proof from the 1920s. You can see another tiny crown end proof here. And if you look at the barrel, you see halos, which means this is all original finish. The serial number has halos around it. That's that shadowy uh, or aura halo around the numbers. You can see that. And then also crown end proof right there. My second Luger is not um, as beautiful, but I, the reason I like it and I wanted to show it to you is because you see here Ensign Glenn Young, U.S. Navy. Now, that's quite unusual because, in case you didn't know, the uh, U.S. Navy never invaded Germany. It was the Army. So how did an Ensign in the U.S. Navy bring home a Luger souvenir? Well, again, if you Watch my videos, I talk about the capture papers and people would take them, they, uh, with, they sold them at the PX, people traded back at the chow line, uh, people waited uh, to, at ports to get on ships, people sat on ships for, uh, you know, uh, I don't know how the crossing was two weeks, I guess. And they had a lot of time on their hands to play cards and uh, to trade and to buy and sell. Uh, so I'm sure that this, maybe he was on a transport boat and one of the guys on board, oh, you know what he could do? Sorry, no contraband, confiscate it and then put his name on it. Just kidding, I don't know that he did that. I don't want to disparage the Navy because my father was in the US Navy uh, during right at the end of World War II. But however it happened, this ended uh, up with a, a US Navy ensign. Um, and this is dated 1939, has the Waffen stamp on it. Uh, the, the holster will have a maker and then Stuttgart, that's the, that's the town where this holster was made. And then here's the gun itself, 39. S42 is the code for Mauser, made in 1939. Now, this has military markings. In fact, that's an Eagle 63, so that's a military marked uh, Luger. But after it was inspected and accepted, it was, it was diverted to the police. Probably the police put in an order. Um, they were all being taken by the army and somebody yelled and screamed and they said, okay, fine. So this was approved for the army, but then went to the police because you can see the police their safety here. Uh, so we know that this went to the police instead of the army. Also one other clue, this magazine bottom, notice the pin. Normally the pin is concave, but in this case, the police used convex. Let me show you the two side by side. I think you can see it pretty easily. This is an army magazine. It um, goes to actually an army Luger that I'm gonna show you soon. But notice how it's concave, indented. On this one, convex, it's the opposite. Only the police did that. So this is probably the magazine that came with it. Again, uh, it was for the German military, diverted to the police. They added this to their safety and this magazine. Now let me uh, grab my last Luger saved. Uh, oh, actually, I lied again. I always lie. I have, <laughs> I have one more I have to show you. I saved you the best for last and it's not a Luger, but hold on. Uh, so this is uh, just a stunning, look at the holster. Just a stunning. Now the holster is dated 1940. It has a Waffen stamp. It was approved for the military. I can't make out the town, but this is made by Carl Bucher. That's the maker in 1940. You see the stitching, this looks brand new. And this 
magazine came with it. So I'll pull out the gun and um, you will see a beautiful BYF, that's the code for Mauser. S42 was up until I think 39. Yeah, and then in 1940, 41, and 42, they went to a BYF code. This is from 1941. So if you don't look at the grips, this could be a Black Widow, but in fact, it's not. It is what I would call a, a brown recluse spider. <laughs> brown recluse is kind of an inside joke, those of you who enjoy my jokes we'll get a chuckle it's not a black widow it's a brown brown recluse because it does have the original wooden grips they are numbered to the gun they're numbered 03 on the inside and the other thing is they did not come with a black widow bottom or a black bake light bottom but instead this comes with two not one mind you but two matching magazines 9703 and that is an R, by the way. And the plus mark means this is the, the uh, extra. Both of them have concave pins. And that's all correct. Look at that front strap. Now, those of you who are chomping at the bit to get this one, I'm going to have to keep this one for a while. I apologize. But this is just amazing. Matching, matching grips, two matching magazines, BYF 41, with a holster that looks like this, I just have to keep it. Isn't that great? It was worth the price of getting in the show. All right, here you go. Best for last. You can tell from the bottom, it's a Walther PP. Notice the black holster with black stitching. Now, if you read my, if you ordered my book, that's right, I just happen to have a copy. Many of you ordered my book about SS contract Walther PPs and PPKs. Um, I do talk about the holsters and way in the back here, you can see the holsters and I say they come in black holsters with black stitching. I do actually have one that is the exact same style as this. So this style uh, has been documented to have come with SS, uh, sometimes ordered for the SS and you do see the Akka stamp. So this was made by Akka and it was made in black for an SS gun and here's the SS gun that came with, with it. Okay, so 7.65, so 32 caliber. Um, the way that we know that it's SS is if you look at the serial number, it starts with uh, 157 and then it's 607. It's numbered here and then also numbered on, a, on the slide at a time when they typically did not number the slides. So SS contract 157, is the serial number. And of course, if we go to the book, you can see here on page 91, uh, this one is actually 152. That's an example in the book. This one is 162. Uh, but when we look at the chart and the way you find out if you have an SS gun, uh, you can see all these. This is actually a third variation, second contract. And I think I am, I said I'm 157, 607. It's not listed in the book, actually. So it's one of the it's it's uh, it's one of the earliest ones. Um, next time I reprint the book, I will add this because this is an SS gun. You can tell by the way the serial number slide, and also it comes with drum roll, ping, two matching magazines. That's right. When do you ever find? Two, magazine, uh, two matching magazine SS guns anymore. These get scarfed up right away. Um, but you see here, two matching magazines. Now what's interesting about this, I love factory errors by the way. So this is magazine number one, magazine number two. You can also see whoever did this, he stamped it K. <laughs> and it's not, it's obviously a PP magazine. And he stamped it K and then they went back and overstamped it P. Can you see that? Almost the P almost looks like an R, which doesn't make any sense, but that's the K underneath the P. Here's the gun. So we have an SS gun with two matching magazines with a black holster and black stitching. So um, I believe this was issued in 1940. So as I said, save the best for last. If you don't have a copy of my book, they're available on the website and I think they're on sale. If you're outside of the United States, just go to amazon.com. You can order it there and you probably get 
free shipping or very low cost shipping. So I highly recommend that because you never know when you're going to walk into a gun show and find something like this and find out that it's SS. Now, the person that sold it to me knew exactly what it was and again was asking top dollar, um, but I can't pass up buying quality collectibles like these. Hey, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed my uh, overview of the Mac show and also what I brought back. It was a worthwhile trip. Um, and just as a little teaser, I have some really cool videos coming up. I, first of all, I have some more takedown videos that I'm going to be doing this week. Some of you saw the one we did at Tokarov. So I'm going to be doing more of that. And I have one of the coolest presentation guns I've ever shown you. So stay tuned because I've got some really exciting stuff to show you.